Hey, audit friends and family. Listen, Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. But plans are important. What do you guys think? Are plans important? I think they are. And that's what we're going to talk about today on this episode of Audit Bites. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to Audit Bites, the podcast that helps auditors become awesome. Join us for bite-sized info and education to excel in your auditing career. All right, friends, welcome to episode number 59 of Audit Bites. And my question for you today, do you love plans or do you hate them? Do you love plans or do you hate them? Because today's topic is nine problems with modern internal audit planning. And we hear the word all the time, right? You got to plan for this. You got to plan for that. You got to plan for retirement. So you got to plan what you're going to save. You got to plan for when you're going to spend money. You got to plan for everything in life. So do you love plans? Or do you hate plans? Now, my man, Richard Fowler is here. And Richard, Richard said this one last one time before, and I had to get him to say it to me again because I had forgotten. But proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Right. And Shri is planning to steal my cheese balls. Well, at this point, you can have them because, well, I'm lactose intolerant now and I can't have cheese balls anymore. That's just sad. And Brent is here and Brent says, especially with fraud investigations, you have to do a lot of planning. Now, for those of you who are around my age or for those of you who remember this, what I'm about to say, when I was growing up, I watched this one show where someone always said, I love it when a plan comes together. Now, I want to know if anybody remembers that show and if anyone can tell me the name of that show. But the basic premise behind the show was that a few derelicts got together every once in a while and they performed these magnificent feats where they actually saved a city, a county, a state, sometimes the world from pending danger. In each episode, they would always make a plan. And this guy is Hannibal. Hannibal was the leader of the crew, and he had a few misfits with him and a few geniuses with him. There was one guy named Murdoch. They would always have to break Murdoch out of a psychiatric institution because he fit in well with the plan. But here's the thing. The plan almost never went according to plan. But after they defeated the bad guys, Hannibal would light up a cigar, and he would always say, I love it when a plan comes together. Now, I think that's kind of similar to auditing because we always make plans. Some people are sticklers for the plan and they get upset, but things almost never go as planned, but it's still important to have a plan. And at the end of your project, you can always sit back with a nice stogie and say, I love it when a plan comes together. Or I guess in this case, when a plan almost comes together. So now, Mike Hurst, my man, uh, Thomas and I were just talking about you the other day. Trust me, it wasn't bad. But Mike says, I like plans if I'm the one making them. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's funny. Well, you know, it's a good thing that you actually are in charge of making the plans for your audit department. And then Brent says, yeah, he likes plans and choices and consequences. And Brent was the first one to guess it right. The A-Team is the name of the show. And, and I think you're right, Brent. I think the A was in quotes. I'm not real sure. But it was also one of my favorite shows, too between Hannibal and Murdoch and uh, B.A. Baracus, and I forgot a couple of characters' names, but it was a great show. 
It ran for quite a few years, but uh, each episode, again, they would make a plan, try to stick to that plan as best as they could, and inevitably, nothing would go as planned 100%. Some things would, some things wouldn't. But the reason that things didn't always go according to plan is because of the first problem with modern audit planning, the first problem, and that is inadequate information. Look, you can do all the planning in the world, but there's some information that you're not going to have, and not having some critical pieces of information is going to throw off your plan, and that might be okay. You see, insufficient or inaccurate information can hamper the planning process and lead to flawed decisions. Now, I'll give you a really good example of that. I started my career in retail grocery, in the retail grocery industry. After being in that industry for about three years, I went to banking, specifically mortgage banking, and I had no clue what I was doing. However, I had some really good people around me that introduced me to something called the Mortgage Banking Association, and they allowed us to buy a lot of books. And so I was like a sponge every night after work reading, trying to figure out what I was supposed to be doing. But, but to the bigger point here, you can make all the plans that you want to in the world, but without adequate information, your plans are going to fall flat. Now, the opposite of that, though, is you still have to do things without having all the information. And so the problem is figuring out how much information is enough information to go forward. How much information is enough information? Have any, have any of you ever gotten stuck in the planning phase because all you wanted to do was accumulate information without taking action? You see, accumulating information without taking action leaves us stuck. And I know I've done it. And I'm sure some of my other fellow auditors have done it as well. Mr. Bellini, always great to see you, sir. Would love to catch up sometime to see how you're doing. So inadequate information is our first thing that's wrong with modern audit planning. Now, think about this. I lived in Florida for about 20 years. And every day before you stepped out the house, you really needed to check the weather because you never knew if it was going to be raining. If it was going to be a hurricane, you had no idea. Now, one thing you could guarantee, though, is that every afternoon at 3.32 p.m., it was going to rain for about 15 minutes and then the sun was going to come back out. That much you could guarantee. But I lived in Florida and I realized, like much of the world, you always have to face different types of inclement weather conditions. And we try to plan for it as best we can. But does anybody remember or did anyone hear about the earthquake that hit New York a few days ago? How in the world do you plan for an earthquake? I remember watching the video and seeing kids, as soon as the earthquake hit, they crawled up under their desk at school. So there was some planning that took place. But even with all the planning in the world, that didn't guarantee that you would come out safe. That didn't guarantee that you would actually do what you were supposed to do when something happened. So let's go back to me living in Florida. Everybody knows that Florida is prone to having hurricanes. And I remember the first year I moved there, I was sitting in my apartment and I was watching the news. And I saw that there was a hurricane coming. So now, if you were sitting at home watching the news and you saw that there was a hurricane coming, what would you do? I want to ask you all, what would you do? Because then I'm going to tell you what I actually did. If you saw a hurricane coming because you were watching the news and you were probably a little bit afraid, what would you do in your plan for life? Because you want to be safe and secure. And you watch the news and you see a hurricane coming. So I tell you what, my granddad called me and he was like, hey, I see there's a hurricane out there in the Atlantic. Yes, sir. What are you going to do about it? I don't know, sir. First thing he said was, you better 
make a plan. So now Shri is saying she would just run and hide in a box. <laughs> that look, that better be one sturdy box if you're going to hide in a box. Ooh, now Richard says no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Yeah, plans always change. Always change. Now Shri says, just kidding. She would probably leave if she could, right? And if you can't leave, board up the windows and things like that. So let me tell you all what I did. I immediately saw Hurricane and I said, you know what? It's time to go. I had just moved to Florida. I hadn't been there that long. And I see a hurricane. So it's time to go. So my plan was to go to my grandmother's house. So I hop in my car and I start driving and I'm on my way to my grandmother's house because that was my plan. Now, somehow I got diverted, you know, distracted. I didn't make it to my grandmother's house, but I did end up stopping at a city before I could even get to my grandmother's house at a friend's house. And I stayed there and I ended up being safe from the storm at a friend's house. Now, Richard says, what category is it? A cat one, maybe stick around. A cat five, run away. Now, I'm glad you said that, Richard, because here's the thing. I'm sitting here running from a hurricane. I didn't know what the category levels were. I didn't understand that cat one was not dangerous. Not really. And that cat five meant you better run. So here I am running from a hurricane. And it was a category one. And so I call my friends up that are still in Florida while I'm at my other friend's house in a whole other state. And I'm like, hey, guys, what are you all doing? They were barbecuing in the middle of a Cat 1 hurricane. Because really a Cat 1 just brings you a little bit of rain. There's not much to it. And you, you're pretty much safe with a Category 1 hurricane. And here I am at a friend's house. When my plan was really to go to my grandmother's house. So I missed my plan, but I was still safe. So that brings me to the second thing. The second problem with modern audit, audit planning is we have a lack of clear goals. You see, while my plan was to actually go to my grandmother's house, my actual goal was to be safe from a hurricane. And if I had just known what the different categories of hurricanes were, I would have realized that staying at my apartment in Florida actually would have kept me safe. So oftentimes we make these plans without really having a goal, or oftentimes our plans aren't aligned to what our goal is. And so we end up missing the target and end up staying at a friend's house instead of getting to our grandmother's house, but not realizing that our goal overall was not to see our friend or our grandmother. It was to stay safe from the hurricane. So when we have misaligned goals, it messes up our audit plans. Anybody ever done that before? Something similar to where you had a plan, but the plan didn't match the goal. And so everything else ended up being off because you didn't have a good goal. Now, I'll give you a good example, too. So I said I was in the mortgage banking industry at one point for auditing. So one time they said to us, we want you to audit our mortgage servicing operations. And, you know, mortgage servicing is the place where you collect the payments from customers and you apply it to their accounts. And back in the day, people would mail in checks. And when they mailed in those checks, somebody needed to make sure that it got to the right account. That's what they told us they wanted us to look at. And they said, listen, we'll give you a week to do this. I remember looking at some of my fellow auditors and I was like, oh, a week? How are we going to do that in a week? That doesn't make any sense. We can't, there's absolutely no way that we can do that. And so once we got that bad news, we all kind of went to lunch and we spent the entire lunch hour complaining because we realized that there was absolutely no way that we could audit this entire operation in one week. Well, here's the surprise. After lunch, we get back and they tell us, well, we don't want you to audit everything. We just want you to audit one specific part of it. And so not only was the goal not clear, 
as far as what they wanted us to do based on the initial goal that they had. There was some unrealistic expectations there. So oftentimes with auditors, when we're going through our audit planning for individual engagements, we either set or we allow people to set unrealistic expectations. And so now, now I've just been giving out some points now. Here I want to get into some things that are actionable for other people. Because if you didn't know, I'm Robert Berry and I specialize in doing audit training. I have a course catalog of over 50 courses, including active listening for internal auditors, assertiveness for internal auditors, better report writing for internal auditors. You see the specialization here, right? For internal auditors and a lot of soft skills. So when we have unrealistic expectations, I talk to a lot of auditors who are, say, senior auditors or staff auditors, those who aren't necessarily in charge of engagements, and they complain about unrealistic expectations, not understanding the goals and objectives of audit engagements. And while I get that, and your managers should do and be better, there's something that you can do. When you feel like an expectation is unrealistic, you need to sit down and have conversations. You need to get an understanding of what they are expecting, because if they're expecting you to audit an entire back office function in one week, you need to start asking, how do you propose that we do this? How many people are assigned to do this? Is there anything in particular that is of concern to you? Those three questions alone can help you fine tune what your manager is really asking you for. And sometimes they don't know. But if they don't know and they are under some undue pressure, it's not fair for them to put that pressure on you as well. What would be better is to have an adult conversation, everyone, so that you can figure out what the expectation should be. So now. Unrealistic expectations is number three on the nine problems with modern internal audit planning. And Adley, Adley says, great points. Thank you. Hopefully you are enjoying this episode. Listen, Adley, I don't think I've seen you here before. If you've been here before, I'm sorry. If this is your first time commenting, I want to welcome you. Here's what I want to say. We are available on all your favorite podcasting platforms, Apple, Spotify, you name it. We're also on YouTube. If you like this, tell a friend. And then tell that friend to tell a friend. If you really like it, go over to the um, Apple store and give us a five star review. Go over to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Now, this is not just for Adley. This is for anyone listening. Now, for my friends on LinkedIn, I have to say this each week, but sometimes Linky is a little finicky with us. And I get emails afterwards saying I couldn't comment. The app wouldn't let me comment. If you're trying to use the app, sometimes it's a little buggy. If you're on your desktop, you're going to be just fine. But if you're on the app and you're mobile, try our YouTube channel. You'll be able to comment there. Atlas says, thank you. You are quite welcome, my friend. There, You have 58 additional episodes to listen to. So now back to our regularly scheduled program. Unrealistic expectations are a big problem with modern audit planning. And I hear a lot from junior auditors, staff auditors, and senior auditors that they feel like there's nothing that they can do about it. There is something that you can do about it. You need to collaborate with your audit managers. Don't just complain. You can cry and complain, but that's only going to dub you as a troublemaker. Try and be solution based when you approach them. They don't want projects to fail either. They're just under some stress and probably don't know how to handle the stress. So you might have to be the bigger person. Right. You might have to be the bigger person. So now let's move along because. When you make plans, you got to tell people about the plans that you've made. Anybody ever been put on an audit project, not really understanding what the scope is until the day you get there? Some of you have heard me tell this story before, but I worked for Deloitte back in the day. And I remember one time it was a Friday afternoon and I'm sitting in my office getting ready to go home. And I get a call from my audit manager. And she says to me, Robert, I need for you to buy a ticket. I'm like, oh, okay, buy a ticket. Where am I going? 
South Florida. Woohoo! All right. Going to South Florida. What am I going for? Well, I need you to be at a client's office on Monday morning. Okay, so at this point, the trip to Florida wasn't sounding as fun as it did in my head initially, but I said, okay, who is the client? Well, I'm I'm not really sure yet. Wait, but it, it, it's Friday. You mean next Monday or you mean like three days from now Monday? Because next Monday we can do, right? We can find out all of this information. And, and then she said, no, three days from now Monday. So I'm scratching my head like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? I'm not real sure yet. Hmm. So at this point, I was really confused. And so what she ended up telling me was that she wanted me to work with another office. And she wasn't sure of all of the details. And I'm thinking all of the details, you aren't sure with of any of the details. Where does this all come from? Like you, you just told me on a Friday that I need to be somewhere on a Monday, which really means I probably need to fly in on a Sunday. You don't know the client. You don't know what you want me to do. Now, even though I was very frustrated at this, um, I managed. That's a story for another day. I think I told it on some previous podcasts. So if you want to hear the whole story, you can check out the previous podcast. But let's just say I made it through the audit. I was frustrated, but I made it through. So that brings me to the fourth point. Well, the fourth problem with modern internal auditing is poor communication. Communication gaps amongst team members or stakeholders and or stakeholders can lead to misunderstandings and errors in planning. And I'll tell you, I did this recently, so I'm guilty of it. Let me share this with you. So. A few weeks ago, I was doing a QAR of a small audit department, and I thought everyone understood kind of why I was there, at least the auditors. And a part of a QAR, quality assurance review, you interview the management team in the organization. And so for them, I wrote this nice little email introducing myself, telling them why I was there and why I wanted to talk to them and send it out. And and this is my fault for the audit staff. I just kind of said, hey. I'm doing a QAR and I want to meet with you. And that was it. So I hop on the Zoom call with one of the auditors and you could tell this person was petrified. I mean, just completely nervous and scared. And she asked me, am I in trouble? I'm like, no. Why? Why would you think you're in trouble? She said, well, an auditor wants to meet with me and you're an auditor from the outside. And so now I'm a little nervous and I don't know what to expect. And so I had to take a step back and I apologized. I was like, oh, have you ever been through a quality assurance review before? Do you know what it is? Did they even tell you in your department what it was? She was like, no, they just told me to meet with you. And so I had to pause, apologize, and then educate her on what I was doing. And so completely my fault, but it was because of poor communication. We can all have poor communication at any time. Your audit director might communicate poorly at some point. Your senior auditor might communicate poorly at some point. Just because you're in a higher position than everyone else in the department doesn't mean that you might not have bad communication at some point in your career. Ah, Hayat, you're saying it's your first time here and you're enjoying it too. I appreciate that. And I'll say the same thing I said earlier. Tell all your friends. Go to my website, thatauditguy.com, and you can see that you'll be able to get CPE for some of these episodes of the podcast. Now, they aren't free, but the cost is very reasonable. So you can catch up on past episodes and get CPE credit at the same time. And Brent is saying, isn't it fun shooting from the hip? You know what, Brent? The only thing that made that trip fun was that I was in Miami. Right. Being in Miami and having to shoot from the hip, that was fun. Kingsley, my man, where have you been, man? I hadn't seen you in forever. You know what? I've got a podcast to do. We need to catch up sometime, though. I'm really curious as to how you're doing. And Shri is saying everybody should come join the party on YouTube. Wait a minute. You were just on YouTube. Now you're on LinkedIn. Okay. Let's get back to number four, though. 
Poor communication can derail your audit planning. And look, here's what oftentimes happens, though. Oftentimes, audit directors and audit managers, they sit at, they sit down and they make these plans for audits. And then for staff auditors and sometimes even senior auditors, they just say, OK, this is what I want you to audit. And you can read the audit plan that they've kind of laid out, but you don't really know what they're thinking because sometimes there are things that are missing. Now, if you feel like you've ever been in that position, start scheduling meetings with your audit managers. Ask them to have a conversation with you about the area because sometimes they have a different thought process than you might have. And I know the feeling. I know the frustrating feeling. If, you, if any of you have ever felt that way, let me know in the chat. Put a thumbs up or something like that in the chat or hit some of the emojis over on LinkedIn, because I'm sure you felt that way where you've been assigned to a project and you feel like some things haven't been communicated to you. Now, let me let me just say this. Your managers and your audit directors and your chief audit executives, they aren't doing this on purpose. They don't want you to fail. It's just sometimes they're moving at a fast pace and they forget things. And so for you, if you can gently nudge them, it helps everyone out. It helps them to give you the information that you need to succeed. And it helps you to succeed because I know the feeling I've been there. Sometimes you feel like, well, they should have told me this. Yeah, but they don't know what you don't know. So it's OK to open up the lines of communication with people in charge in your audit department. <laughs> now, Marsha says LinkedIn seems to be working today after the solar eclipse. That's awesome. I know sometimes it, it gives people fits and then sometimes it doesn't. But but. Again, I made a mistake doing that QAR and I needed to reach back out to people and do a course correction because I wasn't communicating fairly enough with them. I just assumed and you know what you do when you assume. So that's my fault. I just assumed that they understood why I was there. So I needed to change my direction and change my method of communication, which brings me to point number five in nine problems with modern internal audit planning, and that's resistance to change. Look, my grandmother used to tell me everything always changes. Makes sense, right? When I first started doing data analytics, I was using ACL, now, some of you may know what ACL is, but a lot of people now use this program called IDEA because, well, it was a lot easier at one point. So I started using ACL and I taught myself how to code in SQL. Man, that's a lot of acronyms right now. And they rhyme too, huh? But I got tired because I wasn't a programmer. And so I had a lot of errors that I had to correct. And then I found this thing called IDEA. And it was kind of drag and drop. You could just kind of move things and it would kind of do the back end programming for you. So I had to change my plan of learning data analytics. I switched from ACL to IDEA. But that was what was necessary because you have to be flexible in your plans. You can plan the best audit in the world, but you can best believe everything always changes. And if you are resistant to change, you are going to be stuck. You're going to be angry while you do audit projects and you're not going to be as effective. Now, I say that, but also there's a limit to the changing, right? Because scope creep is a real thing. And that means that it requires balance. But to have a plan is better than not having a plan at all. Having a plan is better than not having a plan at all. So let me just take a moment to ask you all a question. How many of you all have gone down the data analytics road? How many of you have tried to go down the data analytics road? I remember I was in charge of one small department and I started trying to get data analytics kicked off. I hired somebody who was really good. She understood SQL and a lot of the other programming languages. And she was working out really, really well. We were able to write some scripts. and I was having fun. And then one day she knocked on my door, came into my office and she said, 
I want a raise. Now, don't get me wrong. She was worth it. I just didn't have it in the budget. And so now a lot of things that we had planned for the rest of the year were about to go up in smoke because here I had a good employee who wanted a raise, but I didn't have the budget to give her the raise. That's a horrible position to be in. That's a horrible position to be in. However, it leads us to our next problem with modern audit planning, and that's a lack of resources. That is a lack of resources. You can have the best plans in the world, but if you don't have people to actually carry out those plans, well, you're not going to be effective. So inadequate resources such as funding, manpower, or technology can limit the effectiveness of audit planning. And then what ends up happening, though, when we have that lack of resources, we then rush our work and we end up doing kind of a bad job. And I hear this a lot from staff auditors, senior auditors, and sometimes audit managers. They feel like when resources are limited, they don't want to say anything because they don't want to rock the boat because they don't want to feel like a troublemaker in their department. But the only way you're going to get things done is if you do provide some constructive feedback. If you cannot meet the goals and objectives, you got to tell someone. And I know we want to suck it up because we don't want to trouble anyone. But then what happens in the end when you don't meet the goals and objectives? It's one of those things where you can pay me now or pay me later. Either you say something now or you say something later. Now, there is a way to say something. You don't want to sit there and complain. My grandmother used to tell me you can either blame or complain or you can seek solutions. But it's hard when you're doing all this planning and you don't have enough resources to do the job right. So what would I suggest? I suggest that you figure out what the goals and objectives are. You figure out what you can do and you start communicating with the time limit that you've given me on this audit. Here's what I think we can do. Now, if you want all of this done, here's what I think I need. And at least you said it. You may not get what you think you need or want, but at least you've set the foundation. At least you've set the expectation. Ah, and now Richard brings up another good point. Audits are like any other project. Totally agree, my friend. On time, on budget, or full featured. Pick two, right? So if it's on time and on budget, you're probably not going to be able to do everything. If you want to do everything and you want it on time, you need to spend the money, right? If you want it on budget and fully featured, then, it, well, you get the point now. I've confused my own self at this point. But, <laughs> but no, Richard brings up a good point because this is like, it's like the three-legged stool, right? You've got to pick two. You can't have all three. So, so now, that brings us to what number point were we on here now? Number seven is overlooking risk. Let me go back just one. So. When we have a lack of resources, bad communication, unrealistic expectations, and then we rush our work, all of this actually leads to the next problem, which is number seven. We overlook risk. I think I said resources a minute ago. Please forgive me. We overlook risk. So again, inadequate resources such as funding and manpower and technology can limit the effect effectiveness of our plan but when that happens we end up overlooking risk so having a plan is better than not having a plan at all however if you don't have certain elements you end up overlooking risk and no one wants that to happen no one 
wants that to happen. So no matter how much we plan for audits, things will never, ever go as planned. We're always adjusting something. Sometimes the scope needs to be limited. Sometimes the scope needs to be expanded. And scope creep is always a real problem. But if we want to talk about the next, and I think we're on number eight now, the next really big problem with audit plans, though, is inflexibility. If we're too rigid, we go back to the previous problem. We're going to overlook risk and audit the wrong things. If we're not flexible enough, we're not going to pick up on those things that we may need to audit because we're sitting here and we notice something that is of the utmost importance. Let me ask, have you ever been auditing something and then you just realize, oh my goodness, there's this risk over here that we've completely missed and we did not even put it in the scope. Now, let me tell you, I remember I was a part of this one audit department and oh, I can't say it in detail because I'll give it away. But we were auditing this one unit and clear as day within the unit. Mm, there was some cash that was missing. There's always cash missing, right? At least to me, it looked pretty obvious that there was some cash that was missing. And to some other people, it was pretty obvious that there was some cash that was missing. But I left because I had to go on another project. And I just kind of figured that they would catch what we had seen. So we get back into the office and I hear that one of the guys that was still there mad at everyone else. And he was explaining to them how the way they had their safe set up, four people in the office had the combination to the safe and that that was entirely too many people. And he was trying to tell them that they needed to stop auditing the retail operations and strictly audit the cash in the store. Because if four people had access to that safe, more than likely somebody may have taken something. But since they had a rigid audit plan, which did not include cash at that particular store because they had looked at cash the last time they audited that store. They just left. Now, the entire time, the other guy was just saying, you guys need to audit cash. We need to audit cash. No one listened to him. We get back to headquarters. And sure enough, about a week later, we get a call from the store manager saying that $5,000 was missing from the safe. Now, I don't know when that $5,000 went missing. However, if we had looked at the risk, put a little flexibility in our plan, and also listened to the opinions of our, other, of our fellow staff members, this would not have happened. Now, with that said, you've all run across time periods where you found something and you thought, we need to expand this. The wrong approach to take is to complain. Cry, moan, and complain like a baby. That's the wrong approach to take. That gets you nowhere. The right approach to take is to gather your facts and your evidence and try to clearly explain to people why is it that you think this is an issue? Factual and actual evidence. But one of the big problems with modern audit planning is that when we make a plan, those plans are so inflexible that when something else looks odd, we can't adjust quickly enough. So now, up to this point, we've talked about nine problems with modern audit planning. Nine problems with modern audit planning. Anyone care to guess? Well, we've talked about eight of the nine. Anybody care to guess what number nine is? Anybody care to guess what number nine is? And while I have you all guessing, I'm going to take a moment here because there's a delay. There's like a 10 second delay on LinkedIn. I'm going to take a delay to say something. If you are looking for training for your audit staff or as an individual, 
go to my website at auditguy.com. Check out our course catalog. I have about 25 courses uploaded. I got about 25 more to go, but if you go to where it says training, you'll see course catalog. Talk to your boss. You can bring me in to train your entire staff. That provides you all with consistent training on one topic that everyone in the department may be struggling with. If you have an IA chapter that you are a member of and you'd like to see me there, tell them. Tell them. I'm going to Philadelphia soon. I'll be in Phoenix. I'll be in Tucson. There are quite a few chapters that I'm talking to right now as well. I just got back from Phoenix doing something else for another group out there. So with that said, if you like my training style, storytelling mixed with education, bring me in to do some training. We get a little bit more in depth, obviously, when we have some all day training sessions. But but had to pause to say that for just one moment. And my man Kingsley has come in with a guest and he says, number nine. Lack of risk based approach. Ooh, that's a good one. I'll have to do that as a bonus, I guess, because that's not my number nine. But that is definitely a problem with modern audit planning, because if we're going to effectively allocate our resources, we've got to do it on a risk basis, right? We got to do it on a risk basis. So I like that number nine. Now, let me just say to you all. When I ask these questions, one of the reasons I do it is because I really believe that multiple heads are better than one. And we're, we are such a smart, collective community of people. And so when people bring in other ideas like what Kingsley just did, it makes it better for all of us to learn from one another. I like to consider myself as just the facilitator here. You know, I'm just a facilitator. With that said, too, I'll wait for anyone else who wants to answer that. We have an audit support group. We meet once a month. via. Zoom, and we just talk about issues. We've got another meeting coming up in a few weeks. And if you want to attend that meeting, drop me an email or a message on LinkedIn and just say audit support group. And I'll send that link to you as soon as I put it up on the website. So that's our audit support group. Okay. Without further ado, let's get to number nine. Number nine is lack of monitoring and evaluation. So anytime we put a plan in place, we really should monitor progress towards the plan. What I've heard from a lot of staff auditors and senior auditors is the monitoring that they get from their audit managers and their audit directors is simply this. How are we doing on the audit project? If you are a chief audit executive and you're a director and you're listening, that's not enough. What you really want to ask your people is, how are we coming on the audit project? And is there anything that you need from me that can help you achieve the goal? And you want to ask, are there any specific things that are blocking you? Things or people? Now, for you all who are communicating with those that you report to, I want you to ask those questions. I'm sorry, provide them with that specific information. So, for example, if there's a particular audit client that you're working with who's not giving you the information timely, you need to say this particular client is not giving me the information that I need to complete my assignment. You also need to include how many times you've reached out to them. What has been the time period within which you've reached out to them? So, for example, I've reached out to the controller on three separate occasions. The first time I sent an email after three days, he didn't respond. So I sent another email after five days. He didn't respond. So I figured maybe email wasn't good enough. So I walked down to his assistant and left a message with him or her. You got to be very specific because I'm here to tell you. The people you report to want to help you, but you've got to give them enough information to be able to help you get the job done. We are all in this together. And it's really about how we communicate with one another in order to achieve our audit 
objectives. Now, not only telling them who's kind of in your way, you need to tell them how long you think it's going to take in order to achieve some of the objectives. Because remember, we all make plans. But sometimes when we get in, we find that we can complete something faster. Sometimes we find that it's going to take longer. And so you need to regularly communicate with the people that you report to and say, listen, I know we started this with a budget of 120 hours. However, after I tested this one thing, it took me X amount of time to do it. Now, I've got 50 of these to test. And I think with that, it's going to take me X amount of time to do all 50. Would you like for me to continue to do all 50 or do you want me to reduce my sample size? The more information you give people, the better it helps them to help you. So nine problems with modern audit planning. I'm not going to go through all nine again as a recap. If you want to recap, listen to the episode again. Better yet, listen with some of your fellow colleagues. Better yet, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and give it a thumbs up while you're over there. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. We do these episodes bi-weekly. So in two weeks, we'll be back with another topic. Nine problems with modern internal audit planning episode 59. Hope you enjoyed it. Kingsley, always a great time learning from my experience. That's what I'm here for, sir. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. And until then, see you next time. Thank you for watching this episode of Audit Bites. If you receive value from this podcast, do us a favor. First, tell other auditors. Second, give us a five-star review. And finally, talk to Robert about training your auditors. Our contact information is on our website, www.thatauditguy.com. It's also where you will find our course catalog, on-demand courses, a kick-butt blog, other podcasts, Robert's best-selling books, and last but not least, audit merch. That's right, we have audit hats, shirts, mugs, and more. Thanks for watching and listening. See you next episode.